My name is Hilary Richardson, and I'm a cognitive neuroscientist and a lecturer of psychology at the University of Edinburgh. And today I'm going to talk to you about the brain and its development during childhood. Like infancy, childhood is a period of dramatic cognitive and brain development. Children are learning to read and count, um, they're acquiring new facts about the world, and they're developing social relationships with their family and friends. Neuroscientists have characterized brain development during this time in a few different ways. For one, the developing brain becomes faster. So those white matter tracks, the connections or links that James was talking about just a moment ago, become increasingly myelinated, which means they're more insulated and can transmit signals across the brain more efficiently. This change is noticeable in these two images here, which show a brain at four months old and as, as an adult. So this is a bird's eye view of the brain where the eyes would be at the top of the images and the back of the head is at the bottom. And you can see that a major difference between these images is in the amount of white matter in them. The developing brain also becomes increasingly efficient through cortical thinning, which refers to the process of pruning away of unnecessary or unused cells. So this video here shows cortical thinning across the brain as children get older between the ages of five and 20 years. The more blue the brain becomes, the less gray matter or cortex there is due to pruning. And this actually results in our brains becoming more efficient. Finally, the developing brain becomes increasingly specialized in that particular brain regions become tuned for particular functions. Within the domain of social cognition, or how we think about other people, we have brain regions that are specialized for perceiving faces, for reasoning about bodily states like hunger or fatigue, and for reasoning about minds, like what people think, what they want, or how they feel. Now, in order for this research about brain development to be useful, we need to understand how these different aspects of brain development support the dramatic cognitive development that we see during childhood. So in my research, I've asked, does functional specialization of social brain regions support or reflect social development in children? The key challenge with this program of research is that it requires scanning awake young children who are particularly wiggly people. So just like those family photos that you try so hard to get before the holidays, brain pictures require children to be still and happy for at least a few minutes in order to be usable. So in the research that James just reviewed, uh, babies completed MRI scans while they're sleeping. This works really well if you're interested in taking pictures of brain anatomy, um, or if you don't have a particular function that you want to study. But since we really want to study how the developing brain supports social cognition, children have to be awake so that they can complete an experiment. And for the most part, the historical response to this challenge was to say, it just isn't possible to scan awake children before the ages of six or so. Um, but we really wanted to see if we could take steps to help children to stay still so that they could participate in an MRI scan so that we could learn about brain function in early childhood when the brain is changing so quickly. So to address this challenge, we use a few strategies. Um, first, before children complete a brain scan, they learn about the scanner through what's called a mock scan. Um, this helps them to learn how to stay still and how still they have to be, and it increases data quality during the actual scan. Second, instead of completing very long, boring, and traditional uh, experiments that adults do when they get scanned, children are asked to watch short, child-friendly movies um, that evoke social reasoning while they undergo MRI. So, for example, in my research, I've used Disney Pixar's Partly Cloudy, which is just six and a half minutes long. And this movie depicts a story about Peck, who is a stork, and Gus, who is a cloud. As you can see, Peck and Gus are friends, um, and so the movie is laden with their social interactions that enable us to study brain regions that are specialized for reasoning about minds, what the characters think, what they want, and how they feel. In addition to being friends, Peck and Gus are colleagues. Gus makes babies, and Peck, as a stork, delivers them to parents. But instead of making babies like puppies or kittens, Gus makes babies like alligators or porcupines. Um, and so this leads to some depictions of physical pain throughout the movie, which enables us to study a second network of brain regions 
that are specialized for reasoning about bodies. Now, when adults view this movie, we found that, as expected, the mind-brain region, shown here in red, and the body-brain region, shown here in green, have different peaks of activity throughout the movie. So here I'm showing you the average response time courses from these two networks across adult participants during the entire movie, with time during the movie on the bottom axis. And the colored bars are scenes that evoke particularly high activity in each network. And these scenes correspond to the known functions of these two networks. So for example, the scenes that I showed you a moment ago evoked responses in the mind and body regions, respectively. Now, using this movie approach enabled us to collect high-quality data among children as young as three years of age, who, until this study, had not actually completed fMRI experiments of social brain development. So we were pretty excited to get this first high-resolution peak at early social brain function in early childhood years. And what we found in this population was remarkably similar responses in both mind and body brain regions. So the red line here, which shows the average response in three-year-olds, is overall quite similar to the purple line, which shows the average response in adults. But we also found evidence for developmental change. Um, by scanning children across a wide age range, we were able to see that as children get older, their social brain regions respond more to scenes that evoke particularly high responses in adults, highlighted here in red. Now, we know that this childhood period is a time of dramatic change in social reasoning. Between the ages of 3 and 12 years, children get better at thinking about what other people want, what they think, how they feel. I think parents of teenagers out there bank on this a bit. As time goes on, your child will more often be able to really deeply think about the perspectives of others um, and to engage in social interactions successfully on their own. Um, so now the question is, is this developmental change that we observed in social brain regions related to these kinds of improvements in social reasoning during childhood? To test this question, we administered a social reasoning task outside of the scanner. During this task, we tell children a story about characters who are looking for their books, ask them questions, and measure their ability to reason about the minds of others, their beliefs, their goals, and emotions. So here's how this looks. And Indra wants a book about tigers. Can you give it to him? Uh, so this is William. And every day, William finds this big gray book about mountains on the carpet. And he likes to read it every day because he really likes mountains. But today, um, before school, Mr. Abbott came and he moved the big gray book about mountains over here to the shelf. And he put a big gray book about horses on the carpet instead. So when William comes in, what is he going to think is in the book on the carpet? Mountains or horses? Horses. Horses? Why is he going to think it's horses? Because um, he thinks it's plants in there, but not. Oh, all right. So can you give him the book he wants? Good job. All right, so this is Chloe. And she's playing a really silly game today, and she's not going to say a single word all day long. So instead she has to draw clues to tell people what she's trying to say. And now there are two books on the top of the bookshelf. One about sailboats and one about witches. And she wants the one about witches, but she can't reach it. So she has to draw a clue for Mr. Abbott to tell him what book she wants him to get for her. And she doesn't know how to draw a whole witch. So she can either draw this picture of the witch's hat or this picture of the witch's broom. Which one should she draw so Mr. Abbott knows which book she wants? Um, for if you do the hat, you might say, like, that might look like a sailboat. So which one do you think is better? The broom? Yeah. Alright. You can put it right here. Ah. You can help her get the book she wants. Awesome. Great. So using this task, we successfully capture improvements in social reasoning with age. So as age increases between 3 and 12 years along the bottom of this plot here, performance on this social reasoning task also increases. And importantly, children who perform better on this task, shown along the bottom of this scatter plot, show more activity in social brain regions during social scenes of the movie, even when accounting for age-related changes in both measures. 
And this is really exciting because it suggests that we can use fMRI data to study and understand observed behavioral differences in social reasoning, which are important to understand because children's social development predicts early school readiness and success, and because there's an increasing prevalence of developmental disorders with social cognitive features. So now I'll walk through one example of how I've used fMRI to understand behavioral differences in social reasoning in my research. One use case has been to understand the impact of early language experience on social development. We know that early language experience is important for the development of language. But it's actually kind of hard to tell if it's also directly important for the development of social reasoning skills. Social development could be robust to variations in language experience because we have other non-linguistic ways of connecting with people. For example, we can use our facial expressions and eye contact to learn a lot about what another person thinks. So one way that scientists have tried to test whether early language experience is specifically important for social development is to study children who experience delayed access to language. For example, deaf children born to hearing parents often cannot access language from birth because they cannot access spoken language and their parents do not yet know sign language. If you administer a social reasoning task to deaf children who are native signers, who have uh, access to sign language from birth, and to delayed signers who receive access to sign language after a delay, delayed signers show delayed development on social reasoning tasks. So this plot here shows that as age increases along the bottom, all children get better at the social reasoning task. But delayed signers, shown in orange, sco score lower than both native signers in blue and compared to hearing children who are native English speakers, shown in gray. And this delay in social reasoning is predicted by the amount of delay children experienced prior to learning sign language. However, because this task involves using language to understand the stories and to respond to the questions, it's possible that what we're picking up on here is a language delay rather than a delay in social development. So to test if language experience specifically impacts social development, we can use complementary neuroimaging data to study social brain development in these children. So to investigate this question, we designed a new experiment using child-friendly stories in American Sign Language, which all children could easily understand. And I'll show you what a stimulus looks like here. So I think you'll agree, pretty engaging. Um, and importantly, the content includes information about the mental states of the characters in the story. So in deaf adults, these stories evoke responses in social brain regions, just like the partly cloudy movie. Among five to 12 year old children, we found that children who learned American Sign Language after a delay, shown in orange here, showed less specialization in the social brain. And social brain specialization was predicted by the extent of delay before being exposed to sign language. So as the age of ASL onset gets later along the bottom axis here, social brain specialization is reduced. This means that instead of looking like the response in age-matched children who have the same amount of biological maturation, delayed signers look like younger children who have the same amount of linguistic experience. And it suggests that early language experience has a direct impact on social development and highlights the importance of providing access to language early in development. In sum, today I've shown you that childhood is a period of dramatic brain and cognitive development and that we can use fMRI even with young children using some strategies to help them to stay still during the scan. So far, this approach appears to be really useful. It has revealed early signatures of specialized social brain regions in children as young as three, as well as gradual developmental change in these brain regions that's related to social improvements during childhood. And finally, this approach enables understanding the mechanisms of atypical developmental pathways, which can inform policies, parent decisions, and interventions. Thank you.